Living is more than just drawing breath. Living is more than just existing from day to day. Living is taking one faith-filled step after another. It's making progress. It's going forward. If you are faithful and consistent through the process, you're going to get to the destination. Stop focusing so much on the destination and start focusing on what's next. Don't stay where you are. Make a difference with the life that you've been given. Hope is often found in the darkest moments, guiding us forward when everything seems to fall apart. Today, we're privileged to explore the inspiring journey of Jeremy Stalnecker, a dedicated leader who has made it his mission to help others navigate the unseen wounds of life. As a former Marine Corps infantry officer and senior pastor, Jeremy's commitment to service has taken many forms, but one of the most impactful ways is through his role as co-founder of the Mighty Oaks Foundation. Through this organization, he works tirelessly to support America's military warriors and their families suffering from the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. An accomplished author and inspirational speaker, Jeremy's story of resilience and service offers a beacon of hope for those seeking to move forward in the face of overwhelming adversity. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me here on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Well, as our listeners begin tracking their walk with the Strava app, I'd like to start by talking about mindset in order to frame our conversation today. What mindset shifts are necessary to transform mess into meaningful experience? There are probably quite a few. I, I would say in my own life, in my own lived experience, the biggest mindset shift that I had to really get a hold of was just accepting personal responsibility. And it, and that seems silly or simple, but when I came home from Iraq and struggled, I struggled in my marriage, I struggled even in the work that I was doing, and I was in, in a ministry position uh, after the Marine Corps, I effectively blamed everyone else in my life for the problems that I was having, for the struggles that I was enduring, for the, the chaos that I was wreaking. It was all someone else's fault. And it wasn't until... I accepted responsibility for my behavior and recept, uh, accepted responsibility for the path forward. I, I didn't know how to move forward, but I had to be responsible enough to reach out to those resources that are available to ask others to speak into my life. But I had to take responsibility for that. I have a friend who says, if you're only 10% responsible for what's happened to you, you need to be 100% responsible for that 10%. And that change of mind, that, that shift in perspective, I think is, is so powerful and really opens up the door for all the tools, the resources, uh, even the ability to think outside of your own feeling and experience. So uh, that's the big one. And there are many others, but it starts with that, accepting responsibility for who you are, for where you are, and for where you're going. That's amazing because... You know, we, like you had mentioned, we can often blame others for where our life is, you know, oh, I joined the military and they're responsible for my injuries. And it's just like, well, where does that start? Right? Like I have, um, I have a uh, older brother who a lot of the times will say, I talked you into joining the military. Uh, you're the reason that, that you have some of these struggles that, or I'm the reason that you have some of the struggles that you do. And I, and I have to correct him. And I say, I, I was 18 years old. I did make my own decision. And even if I did suffer a trauma, it's still my responsibility to then address that trauma. That, that's exactly right. And, and you know, it's, it's important. I just had this conversation with someone this morning. I'm actually at one of our programs today, which is why I'm kind of off in a, in a, in a the corner of a room. But it, the conversation was, it really doesn't matter how you got here <laughs> because we spend so much time looking back over our shoulder and saying, if I had done this different, if something else had happened, if they hadn't talked me into it, if I hadn't been in that place, whatever the case. Well, really, that's just blaming everyone else or the circumstances for where you find yourself. How you got here is far less important than what you're going to do now. You may not, you know, this is how I put it typically when I'm talking about resilience, you may not get to pick the fight but you always get to decide how you're going to fight. And that goes back to personal responsibility. How I got here is far less important than what's going to happen next. And I need to be responsible for that path moving forward. So yeah, you're exactly, exactly right. Well, Jeremy, speaking of how you got here, how did you get to Iraq uh, serving as a Marine Corps infantry officer? Man, I, you know, I think 9-11 is, is the big answer, right? It, the world fell apart and things happened. I was already in the Marine Corps. I was had pointed my life toward military service and the Marine Corps specifically from the time I was pretty young. 
had the opportunity to go through a commissioning program and became uh, an infantry officer, which was a dream come true for me. I served with 1st Battalion, 5th Marines in uh, Camp Pendleton. Um, man, what a wonderful time. It really was the fulfillment of a dream. I, I served as a rifle platoon commander, and then I went over to in our battalion, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines uh, Weapons Company and, and led a CAT team, uh, the heavy machine guns and anti-armor assets and all that. That's what I did. And 9-11 happened, and we thought we were going to Afghanistan. We didn't go to Afghanistan. We thought something else was going to happen. It didn't happen. And so I made a decision. Again, you look back and think that was kind of stupid, right? But we all thought the war was going to be over quickly in Afghanistan. We had come out of a peacetime military, and we were going to get back into that. So I made a decision to put in my paperwork to get out. And um, our battalion, six months from when I was supposed to get out, seven months from when I was supposed to get out, um, ended up going to Kuwait <laughs> in uh, January of 2003, sat on the border for a while between Kuwait and Iraq. And then um, our battalion, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, was the Marine Infantry Battalion that, that breached the center axis of advance across the berm and uh, started moving toward Baghdad. So very unexpected. In fact, we were on our way to Japan to do a, a normal Marine Corps 31st Mew deployment and uh, ended up in, in, in Iraq. So uh, we were all surprised, I think. But uh, again, when you're an infantry Marine, uh, particularly an infantry officer, I think going to combat really, you know, people liken it to playing in the Super Bowl if you're a football player, right? It's it's the ability to put into practice everything you've learned and trained to do and, and done. And so um, that was an experience I was very, very proud of and thankful to be a, thankful to have been a part of um, to, to serve in that way and to serve with Marines in that way. With... Your experience prior to 9-11 occurring, being in the Marine Corps, obviously war wasn't something that we were all thinking about as a country. Uh, you know, even when I joined the Navy, I was on the Navy side. I wasn't a corpsman. I became a corpsman two years in, into my Navy career in 2004 after we, we declared war. Um, and again, war wasn't something that I thought I was going to be exposed to, but I also know it wasn't the defining moment of my life. It's just something that happened. It's something that I deal with. However, there was a lot of other defining moments in my military career. Are, are there any things from your career that you still carry with you today? It's interesting because I teach and preach that military service is a job you did. That should not be your identity. It should not be you know what you're about. But in a sense, and you know, I can't speak for you, but I think a lot of us in this space trying to serve veterans, our service does become somewhat of a defining period of time in our lives because what we're doing today is directly connected to our service and the lessons learned not only in service, but post-service. So defining moments, I think defining moments, again, in terms of personal responsibility, I'm a Christian as well, and there was a moment in Iraq, and I, I, I could define the place I was standing and the thoughts I was having, where I had the thought for the first time in my life, God is bigger than all of this. Um, we do our best, but God is the one who carries us forward. So there were certainly moments like that. I, I would say, though, that the defining kind of characteristic of my military service, as it applies to the rest of my life, was that when I came home from Iraq, I was out of the Marine Corps 30 days later. And what I didn't realize is that my identity was tied to that uniform that I wore, the thing that I had been a part of. Again, 2003, when we went into Iraq, that was a major historical moment. I mean, that's something people write about and talk about, right? So you're, you're part of something big. Came home 30 days later, no fanfare. It was 2003, so there was no transition process, really. It was, thanks for coming, you're out. I went to work actually on a church staff of all things. And that's a, there's a lot of story there, but the next 12 months, the bottom fell out of my life. I almost lost my wife. I almost lost my job. I certainly lost my way. And so as it defines my life, <laughs> I think what that time in the military did for me and what followed it. And in the process of recovering and understanding recovery, recovering on the other side of that, is what has come to define me, if that makes sense. So not a moment per se, but the other side of my service, if that makes sense, has become a probably defining moment is not even strong enough to talk about the impact that's had on my life, my family, and the work that I do now. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's it's really hard to break down the military identity when you transition out, especially if you didn't have time to mentally prepare yourself for that transition. Because, I mean, uh, most service members, uh, enlisted and officer, that becomes their identity from from the time that they make that decision to either join ROTC, go into that recruiter's office. This is what I'm going to do. You know, uh, I don't know if you got the same spiel as I did, but like family did not come in the sea bag. Everything that we need, the military provides for us. However, the deconflicting or the conflicting part, especially as a Christian man, is as you said you are, and as I am, we're also said like our identity is in Christ. However, it's hard to deconflict the two. So how was that transitioning portion affecting you and your family? Because you had mentioned like you were you were struggling with your relationship with your wife, with your family, with your community. What did that navigating back into civilian life as a pastor actually look like? So I was on a church staff of a, a not a large church, middle-sized church. I don't know, a thousand people at the church, right? So there's a, a medium-sized staff, but other staff people. Uh, I did not go to Bible college. My pastor offered me the job coming out of the Marine Corps um, saying, hey, we need leaders in our church and we need leaders on our staff and there's a lot going on and, and we could put you into some areas. So I didn't have a ministry training background, but I knew that they loved us and I knew they cared for us. That was the church we had been attending while I was in the Marine Corps. And Again, did not understanding my identity, I would have said it was in Christ. I, I would have said that, but it absolutely was not. So I came onto the church staff and quickly became frustrated. I went from leading Marines in combat to trying to get volunteers to do their job at the church, <laughs> to try to you, you know accomplish this stuff. And now I'm in an environment where the people I'm working with and around and for have no idea where I'm coming from. And so I started to have these thoughts like, well, you don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what I have experienced or what I've been through, what I've done. You have no idea. Well, that becomes frustration, which then leads to anger. I would get in fights. With, <laughs> well, they weren't really fights. It was me screaming uh, with, with other staff members, like during staff meeting on Monday morning, right? Um, which just did not bode well, as you can imagine. That's not typically what happens on a church staff. And so after several months, my pastor ended up calling me into his office and said, look, this, again, it's 2003. We're not talking about trauma, post-traumatic stress. Those aren't conversations anyone's having. He said, I don't know what's going on with you, but you know I love you. But I also can't have you here anymore if you're going to continue to behave like this. You're, you're so disruptive. You're causing so many problems. I just can't do it anymore. So you need to figure out what's next. My wife then at home, she was having the same conversation with me. I never... Um, you know, physically abused my wife, but I did everything short of that. We had two little kids at home. Uh, I mean, throwing things and breaking things and screaming all of the time. My kids didn't want to be around me. That was my home life. I'm also working on a church staff. And because I was the guy who would come out of the Marine Corps, I gained the responsibility of um, counseling these young military couples, right? So I'm a, I'm a disaster. I have no idea how to counsel. I'm a disaster. My marriage is falling apart and I'm trying to help other people. So that was the environment I was in. But when my pastor confronted me with that truth, that was the first time someone said, hey, you're out of control. And then it was other people like my dad. It was some other men in the church who, uh, you know, they didn't have to, but they, they stepped in front of me and said, man, you know, we care about you, but, but something's got to change. We'll help you get there. But something's got to change. And with the confrontation of people that I knew cared about me and that I respected, and those are two very important aspects to this. I knew they cared about me and I respected them. I was able to step back, begin to accept responsibility, and then ask questions like, why am I so wrapped up in what I did? I began to actually understand what it was to have an identity found in Christ. That is to identify with him, to identify with the victory and the new life that he provides for us. Uh, it's that Romans 8, 1 that says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I, I would have known that intellectually, but I, I had to live through this period of actually understanding it for myself. But it was with the right people speaking into my life and pushing me in the right direction. And then that began a long process, several year process of, uh, of growing and learning and asking questions. But um, getting a hold of that identity and then realizing that purpose is about more than just going to a foreign country and you know doing the things we had done purpose is living for that which for which we were created. Um, 
But all of that began for me when I was confronted with the truth. And that was a hard truth. And it was probably hard to communicate to me, but that's where it started. Not just hard to communicate to you, but hard to hear and understand. A lot of the times when people are confronted with the mirror, hey, this is what you look like to me, the walls automatically go up regardless of who's bringing it to you, especially when it's somebody closer to you. Like, you know, I I remember times that, that my wife or my family has brought something to me and the walls instantly up, not because I was unwilling to listen, but because it hurt so much. So, how did you figure out how to take the cotton out of your ears, put it in your mouth, listen, and not not become so defensive because you were dealing with things? Well, when enough people are saying the same thing, eventually you have to either go, they're all wrong or I'm wrong. And this was a 12, a 12 I say 12 month period because it really lasted almost a year, this period of just me just continuing to spiral out of control. I mean, my wife will say things like when you would leave home, I assumed at times that you weren't going to come back, that you were going to do harm to yourself. That's where I was. And so it wasn't really her talking to me. She's too close. I, I could easily dismiss what she was saying. But when someone like a pastor who, again, I, I had known for a number of years and I respected and, and, and I knew he wouldn't say it if, it if he didn't mean it, if it wasn't real. When he confronted me, then I was able to start listening to some of the other people who had been speaking to me. There was a man in our church. He is uh, still and was then a deacon in our church. And uh, I'm 6'3". He's probably 5'3". I don't know. He's very short, right? <laughs> and uh, I will never forget the day in the hallway of the church. He stood in front of me and got in my face the best he could, and said, you know I care about you, but the way you're behaving and what I'm observing is not okay. (laughs) And man, it it was those conversations that opened me up to being able to listen to people who were close to me, like my wife and other people who I could easily dismiss, but I couldn't dismiss these other people. And again, you have to come to the point, and and for those who are listening, if everyone's telling you the same thing, you have to decide. Either they're all wrong and I'm right, or I've missed it somehow and I need to start listening. If they care about you, they have your best interest in mind, they have nothing to gain from telling you these hard truths, then you probably need to listen. Yeah, listening is is definitely a a really key moment. And as you were telling your story about how you got selected for your position, I didn't go to Bible school, I didn't have training. Like, That's a secret that a lot of people don't know is that the people around you are still just people. You know, we're trying to figure it out. But if we want to make positive impact in our lives or positive impact in our community, our pastor used to say, you cannot change what you will not confront. And, you know, it's it's so important that we have people in our lives that have permission to speak into our lives because sometimes they're going to bring the confrontation to us. Uh, and I know for a lot of veterans, you know, there's this talk around purpose after the military, purpose in life. Everybody is built for a specific purpose. And so how did you eventually go about finding your purpose once you started confronting what you were dealing with? Uh, That's a great question. It starts with the premise. Before you find your purpose, you need a premise. And the premise is that if God the Creator exists, and this I think is where a lot of people struggle, but if you believe God the Creator exists, then you believe He created us, and He created with purpose and intent. And so I have to, first of all, conclude that I may not understand what my purpose is, but there is one. A lot of folks will dismiss just that. There's not a purpose for my life. No, there is. God created you with purpose and intent. I could talk all day about that, but he did. So it starts there. And once you understand God created me for a purpose, you have to take the next step. And and again, it's a process, but come to the conclusion My purpose is not to wallow in what's happened back here, as bad as that may have been, as difficult as that may have been, as much of a struggle as that might have been. That's not the purpose, to keep going back there. So I need to continue to move forward. And then I really believe you need to take the next clear step and take the one after that and take the one after that and take the one after that. When we talk about purpose, often we think that someone stands in front of us and maps out our life and now we understand our purpose. Look, If you're a parent, your purpose is to take care of your kids, to teach them, to train them, to raise them up so they can go out into the world and do something important. If you're a husband, it's to love your wife, it's to care for her, it's to protect her. If you're a wife, it's to um, 
you know, fulfill and be part of a fulfilling relationship with your husband and, and, and all those things that are involved in that relationship. That's your purpose. Your purpose may not be this big thing out on the horizon. It might be, but you start walking toward that by doing what you know. Again, as a Christian, there are a lot of things that I know I'm supposed to do. There are a lot of things that the Bible outlines for me to do. Do those things. And as you walk toward those things, taking one step at a time, doing what you know you're supposed to do today, the bigger purposes, if you will, of life begin to present themselves. If you're sitting and waiting for your big purpose to reveal itself to you, it probably won't. Some people it does. Most people it doesn't. For most of us, it's getting up and doing today what I know I'm supposed to do today, and then doing the same tomorrow and the same the day after that and continuing on until God is able to lead you into that for which you were created. Something that you just said in there, and I want to highlight is you said the clear step, right? Uh, I, I usually uh, explain it to people. They're like, hey, how did you get to where you're at? I'm like, I, I used to take the next right step that I knew that I was supposed to do. And usually that was just treating somebody with kindness, showing up to work, you know, completing my homework uh, while I was doing my undergrad program. There wasn't anything big or miraculous that I was working on that day, but it was that small, consistent effort that then led me to a greater path. Is that what you're kind of describing here? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. And, you know, that's what gets you out of bed in the morning when you don't feel like getting out of bed, right? My purpose is to get up and to make a difference today, um, to find a place to invest the resources that God has given me of time and talent and you know, the financial resources that God has given me to invest those in something meaningful. It's momentum that is developed by beginning to move forward. Momentum is not something you can just start. (laughs) Momentum is developed as the energy is put into that movement. And so you start moving. And as you move, you follow God and he leads you in the right direction. But yeah, finding purpose, man, it's, again, when I was in the Marine Corps, I would have said my purpose was that. And I think it was. When I was working at that church, my purpose was being the best staff member I could be, and I think it was. And then I pastored a church for a number of years. That was my purpose at that point. Now doing the work that I do with veterans, that's my purpose. And so that can change as time goes on, but you have to continue to take the next right step. That's very good. Yeah. So what was the steps that then led you to co-founding Mighty Oaks? I was pastoring a church, and I met uh, Chad Robichaux and the Robichaux family. They were starting Mighty Oaks. and, and They have a great story. And Chad was a Fort Recon Marine, came home broken and uh, found a path forward, wanted to tell others about it. And that's how a lot of, you know, veteran nonprofits start, right, is to tell others what they found to move forward. And so he started Mighty Oaks and I was introduced to him while it was being started. And he said, I'm getting this thing going. Uh, Would you help me? And uh, at that point, that was 10 years after I'd come back from the Marine Corps. At that point, I I didn't really know. I hadn't even considered that others had struggled the way that I had and had hurt the way that I had. I didn't know that was a real need. And through him and through others talking to Marines that I had served with, I realized that there was a need, that my responsibility to care for the the men, the Marines that I served with and led didn't end when I left the Marine Corps, that I continued to have a responsibility to them. And, and that, that responsibility was sharing with them how I moved forward in my life. And so that was the beginning of it for me. And again, it wasn't a bright light moment as much as it was, a, I've got something other people need. My purpose in that moment was, was helping those that I at one time said I would take care of. And I did. And uh, again, you know, we've had over 6,000 people come through our program. We have things going on all over the country now. But, but back then, that wasn't the case. It was, I have something and some people that I care about are hurting and let me help them with that to your point earlier, what is purpose? Sometimes it's just helping somebody who's close and needs help. And and then God continues to expand that and develop that. So what is the Mighty Oaks uh, program that that you're now a part of and helping over 6,000 people through this process as well? We serve, uh, Mighty Oaks serves veterans, active duty service members, first responders, and spouses. We know that so many of these issues are family issues. And we do a number of things. We speak at conferences and do a lot of other things. But our core program is a five-day program we call the Legacy Program. And we bring, um, you know, someone in that cate- in those categories, a man or a woman. We have men's programs and women's programs. Bring them to one of our uh, facilities across the country. We have five different places that we do our program. And they spend five days with us. We talk about trauma. We talk about what it is, what it isn't. 
But more importantly, we talk about how to move forward into the life that God created us to live, how to move beyond that trauma of the past. All of the instructors, all of the people who lead the program have started out as students. So you're in a very, um, a very familiar and friendly environment with people that have a background that's shared, and that tears walls down very, very quickly. It's very much peer-to-peer, kind of a mentor-type relationship. It's not a clinical setting. And so we move quickly to the point where hurting people who have lost hope understand through testimony, through the stories of those who are leading, that there is hope beyond their trauma. And they make that decision, hopefully, in that first five days. And then we have an aftercare process where we'll walk through them, really for the rest of their lives, if they want us to, but uh, beyond the program, help them get into counseling and get the resources they need to, to get the help they need beyond our program. Who's, who's the program for? I know you listed out the demographics, but like who, if I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, there's all these different programs. There's the Odyssey program. There's the surf program. There's the skiing pro. Who would benefit from looking into and then going to the Mighty Oaks program? I, I mean, you're asking me, I think everyone would benefit. Um, <laughs> when we started, we were reaching out to almost 100% combat veterans. That's not the case anymore. Um, it's really anyone who falls into one of those demographics is welcome to come. We're a faith-based program, which means we talk about life and moving forward from a faith perspective. A lot of the people who attend our programs are here because they've tried everything else and it just hasn't worked. They don't have the right foundation to use those other tools to build on. So whether you are, you know, someone who's struggled deeply with trauma, maybe even suicidal ideation or attempts, uh, or you're just someone who struggles like the rest of us, um, man, there's something here for you. It's, it's an understanding that there is hope, there is purpose, and there is direction. We don't charge anything for our program, and we don't charge anything to attend the program. It's, it, the entire thing is free. We remove every obstacle for you to get here. So um, I think if you are a veteran, an active duty service member, a first responder, or a spouse of one of those, we would love for you to fill out the application and, uh, and come to the program. That's, that's who it's for. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I, I know from just personal experience, personal conversations that a spiritual health, having a healthy spiritual life is a key aspect in recovering from mental traumas, addictions, uh, and any type of wound. Why do you think faith plays such a big part in in the healing and not just the healing process, but the moving on process in life? Well, faith is something that all of us have. And people will argue that I'm not a person of faith or I'm a person of faith, right? We put people in categories. We all have faith in something. The question is, in what do you place your faith? As a, as a Christian person, I put my faith in God. What does that mean? It means my confidence for life, my, my confidence for my future. It's in a God who is outside of our space and time. He's bigger than the world that I'm living in. He's not constrained by the things that I'm constrained in. I put my confidence in him because he's bigger, because he's God, because he created me, because he has a plan for my life. And I can have confidence in that. What that does is that establishes a foundation that is solid. It doesn't change because God doesn't change. So then I can use the other tools and, and resources and, and inputs from other people to build on that solid foundation that addresses these deepest, <laughs> um, most personal needs and insecurities and brokenness that I have. If your faith is in yourself, you will eventually fall short because you know where your limitations are. If your faith is in someone else, even someone that cares about you and you care about, eventually they're going to do something to fail you and your faith will fail. If your faith is in a treatment, if your faith is in a medication, those things all fail. They, they're not, they're not uh, infinite as is God. And so we need to put our faith in one who is bigger. And, and, and understanding that gives us the foundation to, to heal, to build, to move forward when the world in front of us is unknown and scary, to trust that even though I can't see the end from here, he can. It allows us to move forward with confidence because he's God. He's already there. He has a plan for my life. He has my best interest in mind and I can trust him. You know, I, I love that explanation about why faith is so important. And I just want to have one, one more follow-up to the faith discussion because I know with Christian faith, uh, a lot of 
people, myself included, and I'm going to categorize myself in this, when I first started that walk back down the Christian path, um, I had a lot of moral failings and it created deeper boundaries or, or, or bigger walls between uh, what I felt God wanted me to do. And so uh, recovery was, was a very arduous process because I kept failing uh, God. Um, and I know for some people that can be to the detriment of their recovery process because they can't deal with the idea of, of failing yet another thing. What would you say to those people that, you know, slip and stumble and relapse uh, even after having an established faith? Well, I mean, it would take, you know, an hour to have that full conversation. <laughs> yes, right? absolutely. But the, the, the Christian faith, we'll talk about the Christian faith and what the Bible teaches us is that, and there's a great verse on this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, that God demonstrated his love to us. So we know God loves us. How did he do that? He demonstrated it in that while we were still sinning, so rebellious against God, broken away from him, Jesus Christ died for us. So fundamentally, the Christian faith is based on this premise. We're broken. We cannot get to God on our own. Our sin, our brokenness, our rebellion against God has a penalty. But he loved us so much that he made the forgiveness of that sin possible through Jesus. That is fundamentally (laughs) what the Christian faith is built on. So for those who say, I have fallen, of course you have, we all have, that's why Jesus came. The forgiveness of sin is the premise upon which our faith is established and built. Now, we should not continue to sin simply because we know God has forgiven us and will forgive us. But we can have confidence that when we do, we have a God who loves us, who still offers forgiveness to those who turn from their sin and turn to him. It's the story of the prodigal son. It's the story throughout the Old and New Testament. It's the story of broken, hurt people coming to a heavenly father who makes all things new. That's the story of the Bible. So I understand that. and I get it. I have felt it. But it's not the reality of God's love and relationship with us. He wants us to come to him as a heavenly father who forgives sin, loves us, and restores us to himself and to others. That's that's amazing, and, and you are right. Like we are, we're, we're not a faith based pro- podcast. Sometimes I wish we were, but at the same, because we can dive into deeper and deeper conversations. But I think you know that's a, that's a great explanation of grace upon grace. Like God offers a forgiveness that we can't even comprehend here in the worldly realm. Uh, but I want to get back to to purpose a little bit because you know somebody amidst chaos. Um, has, is going to have difficulty finding a purpose. And maybe they think they already know what it is. And so we'll experience some pushback. Like, no, I'm on this path. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. How can individuals identify the excuses that they make to keep them from actually uh, escaping their current struggles or overcoming their current challenges? Well, I think that would depend on the person and on the excuses. But fundamentally... If we believe we were created to move forward, that God has a plan and a purpose for us. Again, we have to start there with that premise, right? That God, the creator, has created us with purpose. He has a direction for us to go. Then anything in our life that prevents us from moving forward is what I might call an enemy. What is an enemy? It's anything or anyone that prevents forward movement. But we can use the word excuse. Anything that prevents forward movement in your life is an excuse to keep you stuck, to keep you where you are. Silly example, I uh, would get healthy, but I don't feel good when I go to the gym. Well, we would look at that and we'd say, well, that's why you need to go to the gym. That's why you need to do the thing. That's an excuse to keep you from getting healthy. Uh, I would go to school, but I'm not very good at school. I don't, I don't know enough to go to school. Well, that's why you need to go to school. Maybe you need to start in a different place than someone else, but you need to take that next step. And, and we could give a thousand different examples. I, I want to have a great marriage, uh, but my wife and I have had, have had problems and we struggle and I, and I don't always know how to talk to her. So I'm just not going to. No, the right answer is to get help, <laughs> right? To, to ask her to come along with you and get help, get someone who can mentor you through that we, we naturally resist forward movement. So anything or anyone that seeks to keep you in place, to hold you back, to keep you where you are, 
um, it's an excuse that needs to be dealt with. Now, it's important to note that we all have that voice in our head that says, don't get up and do that. Don't go do that. That's too hard. You may fail. We all have that voice in our head. I think sometimes we look at successful people and think they must not have the same limitations or make the same excuses or have the same struggles I do. No, they do, but they just take the next step. And then the one after that and the one after that, and that's what you need to do. So how do you identify that? Uh, Look at what is keeping you in your life from moving forward, from taking the next step. And whatever that thing is, you need to cut it out and you need to take the next step. And then there's going to be another obstacle, another enemy, another excuse. Deal with that and then take the next one and just keep doing that. And it's amazing how far you'll get when you look back. I mean, this this, uh, taking the next step seems to be a repetitive mantra that you have in your life. And and I know that it it, it probably even surrounds a little bit of uh, one of the phrases that you you use uh, regularly, march or die. (laughs) <laughs> Could you explain a little bit more what your intent is behind March or Die? Because I know it sounds a little extreme. Yeah, it does. There's a there's a story wrapped up in that. There was a motto that one of the units that I served with had. It was March or Die. And it's just the idea that you can stay where you are and die or you can march, right? It's It makes sense in a military setting. And uh, I often tell the story of an ambush we got caught in in Iraq and, and we got stuck. And had we stayed there, we would have died. We didn't know exactly where we were going, but we know we needed to get off the spot where we were being ambushed so we could better impact the enemy and and deal with that. And we did. But that has become a mantra of my life. And when I talk about dying, march or die, right, it does sound extreme. But but living is more than just drawing breath. Living is more than just existing from day to day. Living is taking one faith-filled step after another. It's making progress. It's going forward. Again, maybe your relationships are struggling. Make progress, even small progress. Uh, maybe you're having a hard time with your kids. Start figuring things out, even a little bit at a time. Work, same. It doesn't matter the scenario, but it's making progress one step at a time. Otherwise, you're dying or dead and you don't even know it. There's relational, there's spiritual, there's emotional death. There is that, there's an obstacle in front of me and it's too big. I'm just going to stay where I am. I hit it into neutral. I'm not moving forward from here. You're dead. You may be eating food and and breathing air, but you're not really impacting the world around you. That's death. Well, the next best thing, the the better decision is to march. And I use that word intentionally because marching isn't running. Marching isn't even necessarily knowing where you're going. (laughs) Marching is just putting one foot in front of the other and taking that next step, then taking the next one and then taking the next one we've already talked about. But marching is a slow process that gets you from where you are really to where you need to be. You may not even know where exactly you need to be, but it's getting you closer and it moves you out of that kill zone. It is a mantra of my life. And I I think for people who want to make a difference in the world, whether they say march or die or get up and go (laughs) or whatever they say, it's recognizing there are a thousand reasons to stay where you are and you need to dig deep and find the reason to take the next step. And uh, sometimes that requires additional help. It requires outside help, um, other tools and resources. But don't stay where you are. Make a difference with the life that you've been given. I, I want to hear hear your thoughts on this because we're talking about making progress. And I know people that that are either that are either stuck in it and they're ready to make a change, or people that are stuck in it and have no idea that they're amidst the chaos, but they're constantly trying to make positive movement in their life. Um, the progress can seem overwhelming because, oh, we have to, one, get sober. Two, we have to clean up our marriage, clean up our relationships with our kids. We have to then also get a job, get housing, get a car, consolidate our bills, and it ends up being so much. Or you're on the other end of the stream where it's just like, hey, I'm the CEO of this company. I have my wife, my kids, my vacations, my speeches that I go and do. And one of the things that I I try to encourage people is introduce one thing at a time and get a good footing on that. Build that solid foundation of what you've done. You know, last last year, two years ago, I started at 240 pounds, overweight, unable to run a mile because I let myself go. My depression just got got away from me again. It's part of the journey. You know, we have our ups and our flows. And I tried taking on too much and depression kicked in again. And so I was like, all right, well, I've got to start 
a foundational physical health to help my mental health. And I was like, all right, a mile a day. Once that came in and it built that solid foundation, it took about 30 to 45 days of just consistent getting up. And this is what I go do regardless of the depression, regardless of how I feel, regardless of the weather. This is my consistency every day. And it built from there to the point where, you know, I'm preparing to run the Marine Corps marathon. I'm doing over a hundred pull-ups a day with challenges with my friends. Like we're feeling good because we've incrementally added to the foundation. You know, we've built from the bottom up. And so what would you, what are you teaching your people uh, in your sphere at Mighty Oaks in terms of, hey, you've got this overwhelming goal that you want to achieve. You want to get your life back together. It's going to take steps. Yeah. Um, a phrase I like is focus on the process and not the destination. We become so wrapped up in where I'm going and you just, you articulated that so well in order to get my life where I want it to be. I need to do 75 things. I'm not good at any of those 75 things, but I need to do all of those things. If I want my life to be where it should be, it's easier just to watch cartoons or play video games and eat Cheetos on the couch. Right? So it's just too much. You have to trust the process. And, and that's, again, I, I say this often, but that's why I say march, not run. That's why I say, you know, take the next step. That's why we talk about those things. We have what we call in our, again, I know this is not a Christian pro- podcast per se, right? But per se, per se, um, <laughs> not a Christian podcast. But when, when we talk to, you know, so we teach a bunch of stuff during a week. Before our students leave, we say, you need to do four things. You need four things when you go home, four things. You need to be in the word, be in prayer, be in fellowship, be in in connection. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means you need to every day, every day, read your Bible. That doesn't mean read the whole Bible. We don't say go home and read 47 books. Every day, get up and read the Bible. And whether you're a Christian or not, reading the Bible every day, it's it's a message that will encourage you to to move forward, right? Be, Be in the word. Every day, you need to pray. What does that do? Well, it puts me in a mind where I'm reaching out to God and expressing, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. I'm trusting you every day, not for an hour a day, not for five hours a day, every day. You read the Bible every day you pray, and then you need to be in community. We'll talk about church community or other uh, extended communities. Find a community and get yourself in that community, right? Participate in it. Be a part of it. Don't isolate. Be, Be around other people. And then Uh, be in connection. And we talk about having mentors in your life that can speak into your life. Let people know that you're struggling and they can, they have the right, you're giving them the right to speak into your life. Those four things, they don't help you straighten your life out. They don't paint a picture of what your preferred future should be. None of those things we like to talk about, right? What are they? They're four very process driven steps that you can do every single day. And as you do them, you build a life because now you're reading through the Bible and you're learning these truths and you're spending time in prayer, getting out of the world around you and getting your mind and your heart right. And you're around positive people who are going the same direction you're going and they're encouraging you. And then you have mentors speaking into your life that help you uh, to see the world the way that it should be seen and to have the right perspective. And, and now you look back after a year or two years or 10 years of doing that and you're in a place you never thought possible. It's trusting the process. But that's how any meaningful thing happens in life. Before you know, you're running the Marine Corps Marathon, I'm a runner. I ran the Marine Corps Marathon in uh, October, I guess it was this last year. Um, it's awesome. Um, I've run ultra marathons. I, I've run you know, a series of marathons. I've done, done a lot of that. But that all starts with walking for 30 minutes, running for 30 minutes, before you ever put a mile on the board, right? I'm not worried about how far, I'm worried about how long. And then I start to do that. And then I follow a plan. And then for some of these bigger races that I've done, I've got a long plan that outlines every single day, do this thing. And that's what you do. It's all about the process. If you are faithful and consistent to the process, you're going to get to the destination. Stop focusing so much on the destination and start focusing on what's next. What do I need to do now? And that will get you where you need to go. It really will. It, it sounds silly. It sounds oversimplified. Uh, there's not a dream board connected to it. Um, but it will get you where you need to go. 
You know, for, for some, you said it sounds simple. It's foundational. People do it instinctually, uh, but it's not until we realize that we're doing it. And then for others, it seems overwhelming. You want me to do all of this stuff. But, you know, one of the things that I know that you all stress and we stress it here is it's worth it. This journey is worth it. Why do you think it's important to, for us to recognize that our goals are worth it? Yeah, that, and that's a great point, and that should have been included. <laughs> um, you, you have to have a, a handle on your why. That's a big part of what we talk about is, is the why. I taught a class yesterday to this group that's here now on legacy, and really that's your why, right? Legacy, what are you leaving behind? We talk about that. Well, when you know why you're doing something, a lot of those excuses just fall off. I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for you know this marriage, for my kids. I'm doing this to make a better life for us. I'm doing this for health. I'm doing this so that I can fully use or utilize the gifts that I've been given for for a purpose that is positive and good. Um, Getting a hold of that why, yeah, man, that removes the excuses or at least puts you in a place where you can't make those excuses without encountering your why. Um, And again, this can get... This can get weird for people who say, well, okay, now I have to figure out my why, right? Like that's a big, well, (laughs) it doesn't have to be a big scary thing. Your why can be God's given you one life and you want to use that life to the very best of your ability. God's responsible for opening the doors. God's responsible for the thing that's in front of you. You just want to be in the very best possible position to do what God wants you to do. Okay, well, what does that mean? It comes with some stuff. My why is... I want to be able to be used by God. Okay, well, that means financially I have to have myself in a good place where I can be used, right? I don't want to have to be so wrapped up in that. Physically, I need to be uh, healthy and well so that I can be used. Relationally, I need to be healthy and well so I can be used. So that why has all of these kind of lines coming off of it that begin to help you understand the what. Because once you have the why, then it's the what becomes more clear. Again, a thousand different examples you know, marriage is one that is important to me, but uh, I want to have the very best marriage that I possibly can. Uh, okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> it means I need to learn how to be, you know, a good husband and how to communicate with my wife and how to care for her and all those things. There's a lot of why or what's attached to that why. And once you figure that out, um, the rest of it becomes very clear. And, and I would say, if you're not sure, you know, what's my big purpose to be a, you know, world-renowned artist, to be a professional athlete, whatever. I don't know what it is. Okay, well, then you should put yourself in the very best position you can to take the next step and the one after that and go wherever that process leads. And uh, I think if we're working on our mental health and we're working on our spiritual health, we're working on our physical health, we're working on our financial health, right? Just getting our house in order, that gets us, man, to a position where we can, we can accomplish just about anything. Absolutely. I mean, that why is, is so motivating. It can, for, for me, I know it can change from day to day, sometimes even moment to moment. Sometimes my why is because I want to live without pain. And I know that that's a lot of people's whys. I mean, it's why we have ongoing struggles of suicide rates among our service members, veterans, first responders. So what message of hope do you have for those that are currently battling? Well, the, the message of hope is, again, sounds silly, but there is hope. That's the message. There is hope. And to me, hope is defined as looking outside the circle that you're standing in and looking to someone who is outside of that circle. Again, I can't separate hope from faith. It's putting your confidence in someone who is bigger than whatever it is you're dealing with. But I think understanding that there is hope also has tied to it a realization that you're not the only one who struggled like this. And other people who have struggled exactly the same way that you're struggling have found a way out. So pursue those people, find those people, have other people speak into your life. Don't allow yourself to be isolated. Find some people who care about you that can give you a different perspective and give you tools and encourage you. But understand God has created you with purpose. Therefore, there is hope. He has a plan for you. And it doesn't matter how you feel right now or what you think right now. You need to pursue that with everything that's in you. Don't give up. Um, You know, hopelessness is very hard to beat. 
but we allow ourselves to fall into this place of hopelessness and despair and depression. Sometimes it's emotional. There are certainly physical aspects to that. But mentally and spiritually, it's when we've given up, when we have concluded there is nothing other than what I'm living through right now. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't even matter what other people say. That's not true. (laughs) It gets better. And there is something outside of this moment that you're living in right now. Sometimes the next best step is to get through this moment that you're living in right now. It's to survive this one so you can do the next one. But bring some other people into that. Um, There is hope. That's the message. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for coming and joining us here on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Before I let you go, where can people find and connect with you? Uh, Connect with me on social media. It's the easiest way. Just use my name, Jeremy Stallnecker. So you can find me there. And uh, for those who want to connect with Mighty Oaks, mightyoaksprograms.org is our website, mightyoaksprograms.org. And uh, we'd love to connect with you there. Well, sir, you have such a tremendous journey, uh, amazing purpose. And again, thank you for joining us here on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And for our listeners, remember, you can also catch the One Mile, One Veteran podcast on Reese Across America Radio, available on platforms like iHeartRadio, Odyssey, and the TuneIn app.